Yes, welcome to the Film Education Journal's Winter Symposium. Uh, I'm Dr Chris Nunn, I'm one of the associate editors for the journal and I am a programme leader for the BA Film and Television Production degree at the University of Greenwich uh, in London. Um, so thank you very much to everyone uh, for joining us. I'm going to do a little bit of housekeeping. Uh, that's my housekeeping. Thanks for that, everyone. And uh, now I'm going to introduce uh, our lovely uh, uh, speakers uh, today, of which there are three. Um, so first we have Fedoza, uh, who is an award-winning theatre, film and media producer, director and trainer. Uh, you've produced, I believe, six feature films, uh, many documentaries, and are currently producing uh, a, a legacy project on uh, former President Nelson Mandela. Hello, sounds very exciting. Um, you're the chairperson of the Children and Broadcasting Foundation for Africa, uh, hosted the fifth World Summit on Media for Children in 2007 and produced several multimedia productions for radio and television as well. You are one of the busiest people I think I've ever read a bio for actually at this point in time. I mean, this is incredible. Uh, the <laughs> um, uh, so, uh, yes, you're also an international trainer creating media solutions for all sectors, especially women and children. Uh, you've served two mandates as president of the International Centre for Films for Children and Young People. You are co-founder of Africa's Best Channel, a children and youth television channel in Nigeria. Um, and you are director of the Nelson Mandela Children's Film Festival. I honestly have no idea how you do all of those things, but how absolutely fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us, Ferdoza. Uh, joined by uh, Justine. Um, uh, you're, in, you're in Scotland at the moment, is that right, Justine? Um, uh, founder and director of Aya Films, which is an international distribution company uh, with a focus on African cinema, media education and training. Uh, you've recently worked on uh, the creation of an app called Curate It, uh, which is a platform for learning about film curation. I think that's a really important thing, actually, by the way, if I can just say how cool. I used to run a film festival myself, so I'm very keen to hear a bit more about, uh, about that. Um, a platform for learning about film curation, providing uh, participants with all they need to know about implementing their own screening events, film festivals and film series. Uh, what, a, what a fantastic idea. Uh, designed to ensure uh, knowledge of film curation is easily accessible within the digital space. Uh, which is again so important because I uh, I only got it from sort of face to face meetings with Film London, which was always you know fantastic and very welcome, but you know not not the easiest thing to always do. Um, Your festival producer of the Africa in Motion Film Festival uh, between the years of 2013 and 2019. And as we just discussed before our guests joined us, uh, you're pursuing a PhD on curatorial practice at the University of Glasgow. Um, so yes, again, Justine, thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Um, and then um, we have, um, yeah, where are you, in Buenos Aires, Saldana, is that where you are? Yeah, fantastic. So thank you very much for joining us from Buenos Aires. Uh, you're an expert in uh, children and media. Uh, you're also a creator, trainer, and partner in Children in the Centre Foundation. So it's very exciting to have you with us. As we discussed again before our guests join us, you are uh, uh, wearing many hats as a director, as, a, as an educator and a facilitator. So that's fantastic. Um, again, to the three of you, thank you so much for joining us here today. I am now going to mute myself and allow you guys to take it away. Oh, thank you so much, Chris. That was wonderful. I'm so happy to have Aldana and Justine with us. And I thought as an overview, um, we've called this Children Coping with COVID-19. And really, thank you. Thanks, Justine. Um, I, based in South Africa on the African continent, I was really concerned that most of the time when huge things happen around the world, we kind of forget about children, particularly for us in Africa. So for example, when 911 happened, you know, kids started talking about these aircrafts that went into buildings and they didn't know what that meant. Or when the tsunami happened, uh, we found that as us in Africa, our children did re didn't really know what this big wave was about and what happened to people. And they were quite frantic and quite scared, but nobody was there to mediate and to talk to them. So when COVID happened, um, as the chair of the Children and Broadcasting Foundation for Africa, I was really concerned and said, you know, we, we can't be left behind. We need to make sure that we are part of the conversation and we need to ensure that our children understand what COVID is all about. At the same time, we also have our friends who are sitting in Latin America and in Asia, and we kind of have the similar conversations, our concerns. Most of us have known each other for more than 20 years. 
And we were talking and saying, you know, what is it that we can do? What are we all doing? We were in lockdown, it was quite scary. If it was scary for us as adults, can you imagine what it was like for children? And so we thought what we should do is to have a conversation around how children are coping with COVID. For us in South Africa, um, I'm also a producer and filmmaker in our company's Moments Entertainment. We decided that maybe what we could look at were um, animations and we had just started the Africa Animation Studio. So as the studio, as Moments and a CVFA, we came together to produce a series of animations um, called Wazi's Wonderful World. But before I go into the detail thereof, I just want to say that all the partners and in terms of the overview, it was really to kind of have an understanding of what was happening globally, what's going on in Latin America, in Asia, in Africa, and of course in Europe. Um, our standpoint is always that it's always easier for the European countries. You are much more resourced you have a better understanding of you know, how quickly you can just work with young people. Most of you have film clubs, film schools, uh, film is taught at schools. In Africa, we really don't have that. Film is not really part of the school curriculum. So it takes quite an effort if we want to use film as a medium and to understand how we're going to include the issues around film media for children. So, the animation seemed to be the best way for us to do that. And with Wazi, we were able to do so. I also wanted, as I give the overview, is probably, I don't know if now's the best time, Justine, to hand over to you, just to kind of give us the research overview so that we can contextualize how we thought of doing the article in particular, and then maybe do the case studies. So that's where I can talk a little bit more about Wazi and we'll allow Aldana to talk about her experience in Latin America. Is that okay? Yeah, I'll just do a quick overview. So I agree, yeah, we, ju we decided to look at how film education played a role um, during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, looking at the way it provided information, education, entertainment, connection, and comfort, like specifically looking um, at the digital and how everything moved online and the differing experiences the countries that we're looking at had, because each one had a different context um, in which they operated in. Um, so although the virus operates like quite indiscriminately, the, the responses from countries different for the, from the, the enforcement of lockdown to financial aid and healthcare and the way that knowledge and education um, is disseminated. So I think we looked at the cases that we look at uh, from children between the ages of five and 16. Um, they, they look beyond uh, formal education, so their festivals, their media organizations, um, that have used, come up with like quite innovative responses um, using digital, but not always um, re like responses to media education. Um, so yeah, I think re um, methodologically, uh, the research approach that we undertook was an intersectional one because each country, sometimes like there's a blanket view of film education that it can be universal, that a one size fits all model, um, but it was important for us to look at the, the case studies in particular intersectionally because um, depending on the geographical or socioeconomic location, the experiences were different. Um, so we looked at it differently and within each case study, depending on where it was. So it could be race, it could be class, language, geographical location and context and how that influenced access to and engagement with um, the educational initiatives. Um, let me change the slide. So, yeah, there's a little quote here from Bachman and Zane, who said that um, every form of film education is embedded in and thus influenced by its regional context, which both limits and facilitates its specific implementation. Um, so looking at that, theories of intersectionality within film education can help us to assess contextual dynamics of power and provide a more nuanced framework um, to look at the differing experiences of film education. So although COVID, the COVID-19 pandemic might have been sort of a universal experience, it, the film education um, impacts were different in each location. So I don't know if you want, then the next thing is the case studies. Do you want to take over? Yes, thank you. So in terms of the case studies, we have SIFSI, which is in India. And uh, I think we have a slide for them, Justine, maybe? 
Yeah, there we are. So SMILE, the SMILE International Film Festival for Children and Youth is a festival and forum initiated by the Indian Development Organization, the SMILE Foundation. And basically they used to have in-person, uh, it was an in-person festival. And then they realized that they needed to go online because of COVID. Um, what's amazing when you look at India, for example, is just the population. So when we talk about the numbers of people that they engage with and the young people who actually went online, it was quite fascinating for us to see. And he says, when schools closed across India in March, the, to turn to digital learning brought these st structural divides even more to the fore. But what I was interested to see was that children in India almost had more access than children in Africa or in South Africa. So quite a few of the young people were actually able to go online. They were able to watch the content and they were able to interact. Um, so that is the CFC and they called it One World Children's Workshops that took place in India. They also invited people from other parts of the world. The great thing about going online was that you could bring in experts from other parts of the world to run these workshops. So the content was for Indian children uh, within the Indian context. We saw how difficult it was for some communities because they were less resourced, but generally in terms of the, um, the access, the data access, quite a few of the young people were able to access the, the festival itself. Thanks, Justine. Um, we thought with kids was an important conversation, particularly with where we act with Ethiopia. Um, this is a partner of ours. We've known uh, Brukti for several decades. And what was exciting about Brukti was she started almost as if she was trying to look at a Sesame, you know, the Sesame Street idea. But the, um, the little Muppet that they created was really for an Ethiopian audience. And when COVID happened, it became more important to ensure that they had digital content. This is all educational content that went out and it was on DVD that was sent into communities. So whereas people may not have had data to go online, they were able to get out mass DVD, DVDs into very remote areas uh, to ensure that children were still getting their education online. Um, I will hand over, I think the next one is actually to you, Aldana. Yes, please give the context, um, unmute yourself and give the context because I think this is a fantastic project and you need to explain it in detail. Okay, okay, welcome. Hi, hi everybody. Well, uh, my hashtag quarantine life was born because of the urgency of uh, uh, giving a voice, giving a space, giving a, um, really uh, for the kids uh, to know that we are with them and they are among each other. This was the main uh, objective, to connect kids. That's why the, the, the motto, the slogan was um, stay at home, travel with your stories. And the idea was in the space, in a very small space of uh, 60, 90 uh, seconds, this was the only um, frame that we, get, that we gave to them. I mean, we, me and Jan Bilenbot, who is my partner in this project, uh, we give the space for do whatever you want. Tell what are you doing during the quarantine. So there um, we start to make a kind of a conversation, catalog, archive of all kinds of situations, homes, environments. Uh, the homes could be just a roof sometimes. A home could be a, a very expensive apartment, but not only because of having money or not having money, also because of cultural uh, nuances and, and traditions and ways of dealing with. And what they all have in common. We try to completely avoid any medical, in this case, in our case, medical advices, because the idea was to put children in the center and they, on their own, express themselves how they are going through the experience, their fears, but also what they're doing practically. So we have groups of kids cooking, groups of kids creating crafts and art, kids only giving their emotions. For example, a Mexican, I know that in an audience we have an, a Mexican uh, woman listen to us. For example, this girl was very, very, very sad and concerned because the party of graduation of this year that is very important for them will, will be canceled. 
and postpone and who knows what. And it is not something that you can cancel because next year you have another age. So it is how to deal with this kind of situation. So she was sat there only telling really how horrible it was for her. So we allowed uh, tears, we allowed laughing, we allow any kind of emotions and practical things that they teach each other. For example, how to cook an egg or how to uh, make uh, cookies in Italy. So it was very, some of them play, played the guitar or, well, they are all there. There are more of, um, I think that there are over 100 stories from all over the world, let's say all over the world in general terms. But the idea was to show diversity and to show also this common necessity of communicate themselves in their ways, because the idea is for the adults not to interfere. Yes, we help to produce and to localize these, these kids that want, want, wanted to participate, but just let them go, just let them uh, take their cell phones because it was the only request, I mean, to have a cell phone or to, to ask for a cell phone somewhere because maybe in some places they not even have a cell, obviously, but it was easy to find someone that can uh, let them the cell. So they invent this, this way of telling us and the, the, the format was 69 seconds and you have to say, well, my name is, for example, I am Andana, I'm in quarantine, I'm from Buenos Aires and, I, and I'm doing this. That's all. With this simplicity, you have a word there, you have really a portrait of situation and the idea was to, to invite more and more kids and uh, they started to talk among each other in the, in the chat that was open for the kids that were over uh, 15 years old because it was for all ages also. And it's interesting because some uh, kind of almost adult kids of 16 and 15 were sharing things from preschoolers that were doing things and nobody was judging aesthetics, the narrative, uh, the just let them go and cope with the with the COVID nineteen with the sensations and especially what what they wanted to tell us what they wanted to tell the other kids and to show that really something global that I'm here in Buenos Aires and in Asia there's a situation similar situation in Europe in Africa and it was very uh, very rich because it was uh, saying when well, you are a you are not alone. You really can share this and we want to listen to you. And now look at it from the distance. The archive is amazing. I'm very happy because I'm not only proud because we put in the project, because I think that there we have a lot of information to study childhood and to study how ch children react to a situation like this that could inspire us for any kind of things, for fictions, for other things out of the pandemic. Uh, and uh, it is not a channel involved in the middle that we have to be approving the material or, or being uh, according to a plan, a major plan. No, it was just that. And I think that this, this freshness that somehow um, the project brings to the panorama of the pandemia is very rich. And well, obviously, our, we are the, you are all invited to visit the web page is still there. Uh, you will see, don't, don't go there looking for masterpieces because it, it is precisely, but yes, authenticity and, and truth. And some of them have, thousand, and it's very funny, which are the most successful ones that me as an adult would not say is the best or is not we with, a, with our glasses of judging everything in quality. Well, no, it is communicability and empathy, many other values around that and curiosity many times to know how, uh, well, I think that there are many eggs cooked in the, in the page. You, you have a lot of <laughs> possibilities of how to cook an egg, but many artistic manifestations, some of them uh, wanted to integrate the family. Some of them preferred to have all the scenario for themselves. So that, that's all, and it, it's a lot because I really enjoyed how uh, the, the machine of inviting kids and how the response was the necessity because it was a way of, of a open a, a window and to show and to get out of the houses with their stories. That is basically the idea, was not medical at all, but yes, they all knew what they were talking about. Thank you, Aldana. We can show one of the videos. 
and and we've also put up the slides so people can go and have a look at my quarantine life okay Hola, yo soy Rodrigo, tengo siete años y vivo en San Cristóbal de las Casas. Ahorita en la cuarentena cuido a mis, a mis gallos, a mis gallinas y a mis pollitos. Este es el nido de, de una de mis gallinas. Aquí es donde puso sus tres huevos. Se llama Ocelote. Eh, la tengo desde que era verde, desde que era una pollita. Y ahora ya tiene pareja, es un gallo de color negro con blanco y un tono rojizo con negro y una cresta pequeña. A mí me gusta mucho dibujar. Aprendí a dibujar cuando era muy pequeño. Primero dibujaba rayas, círculos y cosas así. Ahora me fijo en libros, películas, en mi entorno, en mi jardín, en mis mascotas. Pero sobre todo me gusta mucho dibujar animales marinos. Me ayuda a expresar mis, mis emociones y mis sentimientos. Y me hace sentir muy feliz. Hace unas semanas participé en un concurso de dibujo que se llamó Dibujando Esopo. Esopo fue un escritor de la antigua Grecia que vivió hace muchos siglos. Es conocido por las fábulas de Esopo. La fábula que tuvimos que pintar fue la de los, el gato y los ratones. Se trataba de un gato que quería comerse a todos los ratones y los ratones tuvieron que ser más listos que el gato para que no se los comieran. En el concurso me gané este papalote. Me gusta mucho porque es mi primer papalote. Bueno, <laughs> this, is, this is the idea. This is uh, quite elaborated, but the idea was that the kids can direct them. So we talk with the kids directly and they decided how they wanted to be shown. For example, this kid wanted really to be shown and we explained that maybe someone put, a, put the camera up to show how he was drawing. So it all also was media literacy, but uh, they were the directors of their own films. And it's evident that this kid is, is skilled in terms of how he talk, how he draw. So uh, some, some stories were really surprising and some of them were much more simpler uh, and it was okay. And it's incredible because nobody was laughing to one story that was poor, nothing. They all want to know and they all, because this, this kid could be very representative and could um, awoke uh, empathy in many other kids that are like him but the shy ones, for example, all also <laughs> need to be represented. So there are the stories and are welcome of kids that just, just dance or just uh, are, are more, uh, have more trouble in expressing themselves, but the respect that they have, the diversity was amazing. So I'm really, really uh, happy with the project because I feel that I learned a lot. I learned a lot about the capacity that kids has as producers of them, their own stories. Thank, thank you, Aldana. So the other uh, case study was on Takalani, Sesame. Takalani is really the uh, South African version of Sesame Street. Um, what's interesting about Takalani, Sesame is that it looks at the South African context. It included the African languages and it was the first um, kind of global conversation around HIV and AIDS some, some years ago. So with Takalani, because they have Sesame as kind of the mother organization, they were able to raise funding to produce content, but they also used content that was produced globally for, for, um, for the pandemic and then reversioned it for South Africa. With us, on the other hand, as the Children and Broadcasting Foundation for Africa, we produced the WASI series. And I think we have another slide, Justine, just so that we can talk about WASI. Ah, we just have the video. Okay, if, if I just quickly say that, so Wazi was this eight-year-old girl and we wanted her to, really the idea initially was, Wazi was going to discover the African continent. Um, and as we were preparing for this bigger animation, we were in lockdown. So Wazi tumbles out of bed and she rushes to the window to discover the world and she's told to stay at home. And after that, we just produced 25 short animations around COVID. 
This one that we're going to show you was kind of towards the end when vaccinations became available and we were really trying to encourage older people to go out and get the vaccine. Thank you, Justine. Rise and shine, Ilanga liba lele. Rise and shine, the judge Lisabi Ilanga. Hello, friends. Did you know that COVID 19 vaccinations are free? But if you have a medical aid, then your medical aid will pay. So please register for your vaccine and get vaccinated. You can protect us by getting vaccinated. Musa, what are the COVID-19 rules? Sanitize, wear a mask and social distancing. Thanks, Justin. So what was interesting for us around this uh, series of WASI was because we were all in our own homes because we couldn't get into the studio we had to be um we had to talk to each other via whatsapp and emails and and zoom meetings and the animators couldn't as they usually would go out and get um you know voiceover artists and performers and actually in this case we used the animators wife and son and so little musa kind of just you know kind of swung his way into the series. He wasn't meant to be there, but he was so cute. And he, I think he kept on interfering with his mother that in the end, we actually wrote him into the series. And when we showed it, because the, the series actually went out to all broadcasters, we gave it free to everybody in South Africa, but we also gave it to the Asia Institute of Broadcasting, to the um, broadcast, in fact, the broadcaster in Iran dubbed it so that they could have it in Farsi. Um, it went out to Malaysia, Indonesia, India, etc. And everybody loved little Musa. So what we did was then we had Musa reinforce the, the COVID protocols. Um, so the difference that we found with the research that we did was in Aldana's case with Aldana and Yam Willem, we really have young children in the center. They tell him the story. And it's really wonderful to see how they coped with COVID. In the rest of our conversations, we were really looking very much from a media literacy perspective. How do we start ensuring that the conversations around COVID really comes down to children? How is it that adults are aware that children need to know what is happening? So in our case, it was with, through animation with the Ethiopian, with our friends there, they do have the little Muppet and she goes around teaching children. So it's an educational Muppet but the, the resources went out through DVDs. And so they used radio and, and you know, kind of traditional media, but also tried to get it through, uh, through the DVDs. And then, as we said, with India, it was a huge festival that went online and young people were able to access it, even in remote villages, because they were able to get data. That was the interesting thing. Um, for us, as, the, as Justine and I, what we were looking at was how can we give a version of what is happening in another part of the world besides a kind of Western European eye, which is always where research happens. So we are really grateful to Aldana and Jan Willem for the work that they were doing to, you know, SIFSI. Uh, we're all members of CIFEJ, which is the International Center of Films for Children and Young People. CIFEJ started in 1955 as part of UNESCO. It was one of the projects within UNESCO. It is now um, headquartered in Tehran, and the uh, chairperson is, is Jitendra, actually who runs the fest or this particular festival, and he's based in India. So what has happened is also the shift in CIFEJ, where we've kind of gotten to a kind of global South conversation, and we're really spotlighting children and media literacy in these parts of the world. So I want to thank um, the, film, the film journal because you've given us an opportunity to kind of place uh, children's stories that come from our part of the world. And so part of this access allows, I think, um, in you know, academics in other parts of the world, particularly the Western world, to know what is happening here. I know that we said, you know, it's quite a diverse and a mixed audience. Um, and we look forward to the questions, but just so that you understand the context from which we were coming. 
So based in South Africa, the Children and Broadcasting Foundation started in 1995, 96. But myself, you know, I've been an activist as a young person. I was detained as a student activist. So I went to prison. So the, the idea of giving children a voice, of ensuring that children are able to, to share their concerns, that they are part of that global conversation is important. And I want to say, you know, um, at the time when we were thinking in 1994 that we should allow, uh, you know, South Africa was going through its transition and we were going into through to a new South Africa, there was a debate as to whether 16 year olds should be given the vote because we were saying that it was school children who changed the destiny of South Africa. And if school children, and it's, it's not a great thing to say, but it is the reality, you know, that young people had to fight to change the situation in South Africa. So why therefore do we not ensure that their voices come through in every other sphere of what we do? And particularly now, so with the pandemic, we were really uh, quite insistent that these voices needed to come through. And we want to thank you know, the partners who really emphasize child participation as much as possible. And so Justine, I'm coming back to you for the concluding remarks. I think you've just given some really great concluding remarks. <laughs> I don't know if I need to add anything to that, um, apart from thanks to the Film Education Journal for publishing it and yeah, to echo, thanks so much to all the partners as well, because there wouldn't be an article without them, so I'll stop sharing. Thank, thank, thank you, Justine. Okay, so Chris, we could hand it over to you there. If there are any questions, we're ready to answer. Thank you. Thanks so much. Uh, what, a, what a fantastic presentation, some really interesting uh, case studies. Um, uh, yeah, thank you so much uh, again for, for taking the time to do that. Sorry about my toddler in the Daddy. corner here. Uh, she's, she's not meant to be here, but uh, yes. I did get some toys to her. That's excellent. Thanks so much for doing that. Go on. Um, so... I just wondered if, um, obviously, there's quite a lot uh, to digest coming out of that. I wondered if um, if there was anyone in our, our participating audience who had any thoughts they wanted to give uh, on this. Um, I've got, I think there's at least one question in the chat that we can have a look at in just a second. But did anyone, I mean, feel free as well to come come on the mic and, and speak as well. We don't necessarily have to do this all through text. Good. In that case, I'll come to the first question that's popped up in the chat, uh, and then um, I've got some notes of my own, actually, uh, so that'd be quite cool. But um, Tamara's asked, um, did you support young people in accessing data? Um, I, is that around data around, uh, as in like having data to actually make the films or oh, for the young people in India? Um, yes, thanks, Tamara. I didn't know if you wanted to feel free to come on the mic and speak to us if that's if that's better for you but uh yes guys did you support uh young people in accessing data justin do you remember with um with sifsi i think they had said that the data was very very cheap in india and we were we were, that surprised me because in south africa i think south africa is one of the most expensive places for data and we have the slogan that says data must fall so we're the most expensive also on the continent. Um, so the, the data from what um, Jitendra had said to us was quite cheap in India. Justin, am I correct? Yeah, I'm just, just yeah, that's, it was, that's what he said, yeah. So they didn't actually, they didn't actually give them, you know, uh, data as in, as in I, I suppose data packages, but because it was quite, um, it's quite convenient, it's quite cheap according to him, and I think they also viewed online um, through a, a network. So through those networks uh, and their partners, they were able to view the content. Yeah, it was more like who has access to data as well in terms of like gender. I think less women had access to data, not necessarily because of it was an unaffordable, but maybe for other reasons. And then also the rural areas as well was also flagged up as being difficult to get access to data. Uh, yes, I've got uh, Tom asking, uh, asking to ask a question. Yes, Tom, please do. 
Hi. Um, can you all hear me okay? Yeah. Okay, wonderful. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I'm tuning in from, from Boston in the US right now, and I just wanted to say um, how much I enjoyed this, this presentation and this, this really, this wonderful initiative that you guys are working on. Um, I did just have a couple of questions about the, uh, the quarantine project. I think conceptually, it's, it's such, a, such a brilliant idea. And I wonder, first of all, what kind of um, creative parameters the students were given um, in kind of moving forward with their own projects before they were uploaded and, and kind of sent out. Um, and also, is there a way um, that, I mean, I'm sure there are a lot of ways, but have you discussed how this project might carry forward? Um, uh, is it going to be repeated? Is it something that can be done outside of the, the context of the pandemic? Um, just the idea of, of having children and youth from different parts of the world, um, having the, uh, the capacity to just upload um, short stories about what they're doing. I, I, I thought the short film that was screened um, was, was really quite moving. So I just was wondering what your, uh, your plans are for that. Yes, Tom, I can, I can answer you in several directions. First of all, it was not, um, I mean, it was a media literacy project for the family because they are, were all together. So somehow the kids that wanted to participate have our assistance, but not our classes. If they want to know more, that's why I underlined that this kid was very particular. We share with them some information, tips or links to show, but if not, they can I mean, there are kids that are just with the cell phone saying, hi, I am in Mendoza, this is horrible, the pandemic, I want to, and that's all. And this is his narrative. So it's, it was media literacy in the sense that they could feel that there was a platform with few rules and they could put there their content and it was easy to, to, to talk about a serious topic, not about only be a YouTuber, let's say, just to express themselves in in the context of a project. So the, the project was not a media literacy per se. What yes happened is many of them made the movies and wanted to know more. So we kept on in touch with them or with the families or with, with the, but it was really, I mean, sometimes was the grandfather who was holding the cell phone with the direction of the kid. I mean, it was really an hybrid and uh, all kinds of levels. And it was not the important thing. The core of the project was, do whatever you want in this space that is yours and tell us about the, your pandemia, your version of the pandemia. That was, that is the name in my hash quarantine life. Saying that now, uh, Jan Bilan especially is working in another project that is, is more uh, sophisticated in terms of media literacy, which is called my life, not my, my quarantine life, but my life. And it deals with news, with reporting. There, yes, it's an evolution because we noticed that it was very interesting for, for them to have a platform where to express, in this case, how to cover realities, no? realities of many kinds, not only COVID, but more. So it grew. And the most important thing is that we really felt and feel that there is a universe to explore that has nothing to do with the institutionality of the channels or of the bureaucracy. It's not because it is bad, obviously it has to exist and, and the state has to provide information and uh, they have to, to learn a lot about how to, to make this, as Phil Do said, uh, this information that is very complicated for us adults to the kids, no? For to be uh, understood. But uh, the idea is uh, to show them that even in serious things like news, like COVID, like very sensitive information, they can have their space, they can have their voice, that with, with few instruments, they can make a report, a journalistic report, well done about their lives and their context. Their life means being informed is part of the life, is a right, and I have, have I can have my opinion and my coverage on something. So yes, it is evolving in so many directions, but always a platform and sometimes connected to channels. For example, there were channels that asked for the material because nobody could produce. So it was, nobody could go to the houses to record the kids and there we have the material with the kids doing their own. So everything changed. And there were a lot of arrears that were like we now, all together discussing uh, some borders and barriers that were really um, 
uh, were disappearing because now the tolerance of the quality checking technical aspects in the television program was completely destroyed. Now, it was the beginning of a shy thing of uh, the reporters, the spontaneous reporting, but now it's part of the content is made by the public. So these kind of things, to have the opportunity to talk with kids and to give the, the places where they will be respected and it, is, it makes sense what they have to, to tell, it's very important to, to really start, as Firdo says, from the very beginning, very beginning, the, eight, 10, some, some, sometimes, I don't know, five years old, to know that they can give a message to others and there's a space that they can uh, take and the space is them, theirs, no? And so it is very interesting and obviously it will evolve, but it was not immediately there in terms, of you have to do this, is you have the space, you have the camera, if you need assistance, call us and, I repeat the, the anecdote of the, of the granny because it was very funny, grandfather calling us, but how can I do too? And we together, we try to make the kid be uh, as much director of his own movie or tale as possible, but with the help of the family. So imagine that that grandfather learned a lot. Well, the, the, uh, many adults learned a lot during the pandemic about technology. So that gap was reduced during pandemia because you know, grandparents and kids had to communicate through media. So it's, it's a very, um, we can see it obviously as a huge, huge and terrible crisis, but also a huge opportunity for us and for, for kids that cannot get into the channel or that the channel will discriminate or whatever to have their own spaces and to know how to deal with them apart from the commercial or the popularity that the, the, the social networks can offer. I mean, this is a project that has a sense and they are very proud of belong to that community of uh, messengers, let's say, of their own lives. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, very interesting to hear about that. I agree with your comment towards the end there about how as awful as the pandemic has been, it has absolutely opened up all kinds of opportunities for how young people and older people can, can connect with, with technology and uh, use, use film, cinema, video, whatever, as a way to... Yes, I um, would say that broke, broke many prejudices in terms of how, what, what is quality and what is not in narratives and in technical quality also. And this is very great because it was a barrier and very expensive thing. And this was demolished by the pandemic in terms of education also. Yeah. Great, thank you so much um, for, for that. There's a lovely comment in the, in the chat from Jacqueline um, that says obviously it's a great initiative uh, to look out for young ideas. And I think as we've just also partly stressed, uh, that's important because they have a completely different view uh, to us adults. Um, so I quite like that. Uh, thank you, Jacqueline, for that comment. I think uh, really important. Um, I wondered if I might ask um, a question. Um, it occurs to me having Sorry, there's a cat here. Yeah, okay, he's going. That's fine. Uh, the, <laughs> I'm just joined by so many uh, uh, yeah, toddlers and pets. I wonder I get anything done. But um, it occurred to me when when sort of thinking about your own biographies and work and 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 the, I'm going to say the many hats that the the three of you here are wearing, and I imagine many other people uh, on this session are also wearing those multiple hats. You know, we are uh, we are filmmakers possibly first but maybe we're curators first and then we're also partly educators and then we're also partly researchers and then we're also running uh sort of uh, uh educational charities and all these and i i wonder if there's um i wonder if any of you had any thoughts on what the value of that is i think often you know uh uh you know often, I don't know, I'm reminded of that ridiculous phrase, you know, those that can't do teach, you know, which I think is, is, uh, is, is complete, uh, is uh, completely ridiculous. Um, so I'm thinking, you know, in terms of that, all, all of us, many of us, I, I would include myself in this as well, are doing all sorts of different things, actually. Um, but, but um, education kind of is something we keep coming back to. So I wonder if you had any thoughts on the advantages to having uh, many hats and doing all these kind of different bits and pieces, um, apart from perhaps a steady income, you know, which maybe is not there because you're doing all these bits and pieces, but yeah. 
well, I'm always wearing a different hat. Mm -hmm. uh, and and I, I agree, Chris, I think a lot of the time we do say those who can't do teach. But I think we are teaching all the time. It's part of what we do. And I love how Aldana says we, we, we teaching and learning because it's just this continuous cycle of growth. Um, and it's important, I think, that you need to have the different hats because as a producer, you have a very different view to being you know, the subject, to being the storyteller, to being the writer, to being, you know, so which hat are you wearing? I do have to say at one point, I, I thought, especially when my daughter was now 34 years old and a lawyer, when she was little and she'd say to me, mom, what do you do? My school, my teacher asks, what does your mother do? <laughs> and it's been very hard for her to say what I do. And then when I eventually, when she became a lawyer and was doing her articles, um, her, her head of whatever said to her, so what does your mother do? And, and she said, well, she does you know, several things. And he said, well, does she make money? And she came back and she was like, mother, do you make money? And I said, well, tell your, tell your boss that it is not always about making money. It is about what we do that is important. And I think it's that. I think it's passion. I think you've got to really have a feeling and a flow for the work that is important. And so for me personally, you know, my partner and I both, we work together, we live together. Um, so, you know, it's kind of 24 seven, but we give each other turns because he's, he's a film director. I'm more in the space of theater. Uh, and performance and then both of us love children's media and children's work so you know there'll be a time when you say okay now we just have to this, this pandemic happened um abc the, the the animation studio needs our time needs our resource needs our people power go out there and do that and so you've got to find time i think where you've got to focus on one thing that needs all your time um, I'm also doing, as Justine is, my PhD at the tender age of 59. That was my pandemic gift to myself. People thought I was crazy. Every time I say it's a gift, they're like, how can that be a gift? It's trauma. Well, my, it is my gift. And I'm, I'm doing this PhD alongside everything else. And the PhD is a theater piece where I'm talking about the struggle, you know, the women's struggle in South Africa. I was part of the women's movement as a student activist and it's never been written and that's what I'm doing. So in between all of this, I'm running off and, and doing theater, which I think is really exciting. So yes, I think carrying all those hats are important and I know that Aldana does too. Over to you, Aldana. Yeah, and basically I um, get really, really into my, my, my passion, my, my uh, original passion, which is photography. Photography. So I took a lot, a lot of photographies during the pandemic and really reconnecting from another point of view and integrating that. And I'm very happy. I, I discovered many things. And also my kids at home uh, were learning a lot through the, through the media, the courses that they wanted for free. There were a lot of things. So um, yes, I think that for producing um, and for having really to the, the fit on earth and to understand what kids uh, are needing and to study and observe, it's very good. I even, even when have been a presenter myself. So it's very, very different when you have a, a comment on a presenter, how to do something if you haven't been there, because it is so uh, patronizing to, to, to give opinion on certain um, task when you haven't been through that. So I'm super privileged that I could edit, I could uh, have sometimes a final cut, sometimes I have to tolerate this final cut of someone else. Well, I'm not, I, I, I think different. So all these kind of experiences, I, but obviously I also clean a study. It's not a question of being the queen. All these kind of things helps a lot. Uh, preparing a catering, uh, not having a guest and having to improvise, uh, being in, in big studios, little studios, um, no studios, you know, these kind of things. Uh, really, it is impossible to get out of the university knowing how to do these kind of things, especially with kids. So um, this kind of uh, be a little bit of everything it's not that you don't know a, a lot about something in particular. I think that this thing, that a lot that you have to learn only can be learned 
by going through different experiences, really, and traveling also, having the privilege to travel is very important. Knowing other cultures, knowing other approaches and points of view, other ways of uh, narration and aesthetics and ethics also. It's very important to put all that in dialogue because obviously nobody has the truth. And it's not only one way of doing things, so it's very rich and especially for kids. We cannot teach kids only one thing. And I was thinking about uh, the languages here. How did you manage with all the languages? Because our project is bilingual in terms of they speak in the language that they, their own languages. And we have the work of subtitling everything with a lot of effort, but we did it. We managed to have it an international dimension. If not, it is, it is a contradiction. How your animation series could deal with languages? In South Africa, we we only use English. Um, we have some Kiswahili. I think there was one of two, and that is only because we had a partner from Kenya who wanted it, and so they they did it themselves. Um, and then the the Iranians who, who um, translated into Farsi. But you know, as Aldana, because it's animation, it's easy for them to put the voiceover. And so that was really what we did. We gave it, you know, it was to anybody. You could take it and use your own voice. So, so that was yes. really, uh, yeah. No, I, you know why, Africa. sorry, sorry that I am taking the scenario, but this is very important because I was very impressed by LK, which is our one of our group that took all the effort to give all the information that she was finding through her producer company to the indigenous language, because some of them were completely out of information, out of reality out of the idea so all of this medical information to build pieces especially for people who cannot access not because of technology but because of languages is also important and i wanted not to forget in this conversation that this is also important absolutely i agree with you um I, so so in south africa because we didn't really have a budget and oh i have to i have to say this i was very excited that you know with prisoners the Wazi uh, animations were part of the top 10. And then we were looking at these like Sesame that had millions of dollars and we had like zero budget. So it was also just like your, your beautiful work. You know, I think Chris, what's important was really around the resource. So the resource to produce content, um, which is so diverse in each of our countries and how we were able, because we're part of networks, we're able to share and give each other and then make sure that, you know, Somehow you can take this for free and you can do what you need to do with it, which is, which is how we all kind of worked on, on during the pandemic. But um, Justine, we were still talking about the many hats because you do too. We wear lots of hats and you help us a lot. Justine's the young one, Chris, so we, we, we need her all the time with us. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, well, I was thinking that my hats all like feed into one another and sort of reinforce each other. So my PhD, I theorize, like theorize and think theoretically about my curatorial practice, and that helps me reflect on that. Then that informed the creation of the app, I guess. It gave me like a more of an understanding of what curation is and how to sort of lay it out in both a practical and a theoretical way. Um, so I developed an app called Curate It, which is a step-by-step -step guide um, for creating a film festival, as you said at the beginning. Um, and then that, yeah, then, then that leads into thinking about space and how I can make knowledge more accessible and sort of break down those barriers to inst like, of institutional access um, to knowledge around film curation and exhibition. So I think each one, even though they're different, each one of my hats sort of is interchangeable. It fits into each other. Lovely. Thanks so much. Um, as ever, I thought that question you know could open a nice discussion i think it did so thanks so much for that guys um did uh did anyone else have any last questions i think then we can start to wrap up um just if anyone else has a burning question that must be asked from our fantastic guests uh, yeah, a reminder there in the chat that we have a new edition of the film education journal online uh, and there is indeed a link in the chat uh, earlier uh, to read Justine and Fedoza's paper that we, we published as well uh, around some of this work. Um, so yes, I think we'll bring that to a close. Um, thank you very much to our, our lovely uh, uh, panel. Uh, thank you for, for joining us uh, and, and indeed all of our guests from all over the world. What a lovely, uh, what a lovely coming together of people. So thank you so much everyone for taking the time 
to join us. And again, thank you to our lovely guests. The Film Education Journal Winter Symposium continues tomorrow. Um, I think is it, I think it's 4.30 again, uh, this time with a discussion around uh, uh, how uh, educators in Scotland have been using film in different contexts. So hopefully we'll see some of you fabulous people there again. Bye.